watching Spill and Ink. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Spilling Ink, the talk show that takes you behind the book to meet the authors and artists in the publishing industry. I am your devilishly handsome host, Jason Lavelle, and with me today we have New York Times best-selling author Jacqueline Carey. Hey Jacqueline, how are you today? Hey, I'm good. Wonderful. Devilishly handsome, huh? Devilish. <laughs> and extremely <laughs> modest. <laughs> That's what my, my wife tells me anyway. So, uh, so you're an author, I'm an author, but for those of us out there that may not know you, tell me a little bit about what you do, what you write. Uh, everything I've written has been under the broad umbrella of fantasy, but uh, within that definition, this is uh, Starless, which you have there, is my 18th novel, and um, they've all been quite different. I've done historical fantasy, contemporary paranormal, near future dystopia. And I have recently finished reading Starless, and I loved it. And this was a totally new kind of fantasy for me. I have been reading a lot of uh, Victoria Schwab this, this summer, um, who writes fantasy, but, but not epic fantasy. And then I recently read Six of Crows, which I was a big fan of. Um, but this is something completely different, and I wasn't expecting it, because when I think of epic fantasy, I'm thinking of, I always think it's gonna be a little bit more slow moving. Mm -hmm. And this book wasn't slow moving at all. It was, an adventure from start to finish, which I thought was fantastic. Um, but you probably described it best at a signing that I saw you at not long ago. What was the word that you used to describe the the type of storytelling? I believe it was exuberant. Exuberant. Yeah. Yes. And it's it is rare to have a standalone epic fantasy uh, that hits those tropes where you have a there's a dark god rising, there's a prophecy, there's a ragtag band of adventurers. Um, there's an oracle. There's, yes, but I put a little spin on everything and condensed it into one single volume. Yes, and is there any chance that there's going to be a follow-up to this? I always say, never say never. Mm -hmm. um, I don't intend there to be. Okay. Uh, I think the ending is kind of perfect and resonant and even a little meta, um, but you never know what the muse may send you. <laughs> okay. Well, and I, and I personally, I, I love standalone books um, because I, I like to be able to just digest it all at once. However, when I got to the end of this, I was a little sad because it was like, oh my God, these are like my new favorite people <laughs> and I don't want it to end. I don't want them to end. Um, but no, so for those of you who, who haven't read Starless, if you're a fan of fantasy or even new to fantasy, check it out. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about writing here, and I'm going to reference this book while I'm talking about it. So while I'm going to make it so that everyone can understand, it, it definitely will be easier if you go out and pick up this book and read it. So your characters were nothing like the characters I read in most, most books. No, that's definitely true. <laughs> and I was... I was blown away. They, I, w I was truly blown away. Not only did they feel very real to me, because um, every character, including characters that I thought were just kind of there on the side, they all had their own backstory. Mm -hmm. um, they all had real depth to them. And they were all, and, and Kai, one of our main characters, um, and th this is not a spoiler, because you yourself mentioned it during the signing, so that makes it okay for me to do. Um, Kai has grown up thinking that he was a boy, when in actuality he is Bazim. Is it Bazim? Bazim, yes. Bazim, uh, which is a boy who, uh, a, a female who was raised as a male. And you had already mentioned it in the in the signing, so when I got to that point, I was, I was already expecting it based on thing, you know, context clues in the book, but it was such a cool twist on the, you know, the warrior character that I'm mm -hmm. used to seeing, especially in sci-fi and fantasy novels. And then our princess, who is gorgeous and awesome, also has a disability. Mm -hmm. now, like these, these are not the characters I expected at all. Now, when you when you sat down to write this, did 
you know that you wanted to make your character something really different and unique, or is it something that just developed as you were writing? Or I mean, what was your what was your plan there? Uh, Kai's character was inspired, and this may surprise people somewhat because as we're as a culture coming to understand gender fluidity more, you might think it came from a contemporary source of inspiration, but actually uh, it was an article I read in The Guardian, and then I subsequently read the book by this author, um, I forget the author's name, but The Underground Girls of Kabul is the book, and it's about this practice in Afghanistan, which is also, I've heard, in Pakistan and some of the Balkan states where a family that has not had a male child will, for the sake of honor, designate a young girl to be an honorary boy. And the term in, uh, in, in Dari, in the Persian dialect, bacha posh, is bacha posh. dressed okay. like a boy. Okay. And so this girl then gets a new name, she gets to wear boy's clothes, gets her hair cut, enjoys all the rights and privileges, playing soccer, climbing trees, until either um, a biologically male child is born into the family, or puberty hits, okay. at which point she is expected to become a girl again. Okay. Which creates this artificially induced gender dysphoria. Yeah. And so I was just really intrigued by that idea and the fact that it came out of such a conservative setting. Um, now, in, in this real, real world example, do the, do the children that are raised like this, do they understand that they're be ra being raised as a male, or...? or... Um, it seemed like there was quite a range of understanding, and also a real range of reacting to the expectation that, oh, you're a girl now. It seems like that would be very jarring isn't even yeah is it doesn't even right. come close i don't think but right. um so, yeah. wow what a mind bender yeah. so so that moment of revelation when kai who's raised by this warrior sect in the desert discovers that he is not in fact biologically male was inspired by that um for the character of zaria the princess i there wasn't one specific point of inspiration that made me decide she will be physically disabled. Uh, but I did read a lot of threads. Um, there's an author, science fiction and fantasy and sort of historical fiction, uh, Nicola Griffith, who um, has a pretty debilitating form of multiple sclerosis and has recently begun writing about that. And what um, she and others are calling cripplet, and uh, how offensive the trope of a physically disabled character being magically healed is in the genre. And I, you know, I admit, if I had not encountered that, I was thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great if she was magically healed? So, and 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 I was I was kind of expecting that. I mean, as a, as I'm, you know, I'm sure you know. Well, that's interesting. I. I never thought of that. I never, right. And I never would think of that, I, I guess, because I, I don't, I haven't experienced that. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. But, and you, you also, not only do you have characters that are, are much different than what we would expect, but sexual orientation or sexual preferences are, are kind of fluid as well. They, mm -hmm. it's, it's all over the map. Mm -hmm. And I, I love reading that because. Especially in the, and I'm not going to talk about politics, I promised you, Katie. Um, but especially in the world today, even though I feel like we've, we've grown a lot, it, it seems like in this country we're, we're kind of backsliding a little bit. And it's really cool to me to see characters that can identify as something other than heterosexual, that, mm -hmm. that can be fluid with who they love and, and what they want to do. Um, and that brings up something that I did want to talk to you about, and that's inclusivity. And I've been reading your, your blog a little bit here and there, and you've you had a, a great post about uh, Wonder Woman, 
and, and I like that a lot, and especially some of your interactions with a, with a man online. But how important do you feel it is for us to be having female heroes or characters that, that aren't heterosexual in these, these books? Do you think that's something that we need to see more of, and, and why? I do. I think representation is, is hugely important. Um, and that's why, you know, you had, myself included, women literally tearing up at this representation of a female superhero who simply refuses to be told no. By, she was a badass. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and then you look at, you know, the massive success of Black Panther and how much, uh, you know, hunger there was for representation of this idea of an African nation that was never colonized. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, you know, to for kids in particular to grow up believing they can be whatever they want to be, they need to see representations of people like them, you know, whether it's gender or race or sexuality, uh, achieving and being heroic. I have three girls. I have, I have three daughters and, and a son. And our household is very, very liberal when it comes to our identities and sexualities and even our political beliefs. And my kids are, I, I have a fantastic eclectic mix of kids, uh, but my youngest is in a Spanish immersion program. So, and she's actually with a, a lot of Spanish speaking students. Mm -hmm. and. It makes me so happy that when we are out in the real world and she's interacting with people, she doesn't care what they look like or sound like at all. They're just they're just more people or more friends for her to have. And that's I think awesome. that that's not something that was around when I was a child. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I lived in a, a country town and everyone in my school was, was white and we didn't know anything else. Um, and I, I don't feel that's a fantastic way to, way to live. So yeah, I, I think that inclusivity and, uh, and, what did you call it? Representation. Representation, yes. Yeah. I think that is a, a very good thing. And I think that this book does it does it very well. Um, also, we, we have all sorts of different types of skin colors in this book, which mm -hmm. is fantastic too. So I love to see that. And have you always done this with your writing? You know, represented as, as many different races and sexualities as, as you could? Uh, to some extent. Um, the Kushil's Legacy series, which I'm best known for, is sent in an alternate uh, medieval France, essentially. So, um, predominantly the core populace is Caucasian. Um, but I've got a pretty good... Um, analog to the Roma people, um, better known as gypsies to most of us in America. Um, and then as the books go on, they kind of <laughs> spread out and cover more territory and they're okay. able to bring in a lot more diversity. And I have not, I'm ashamed to admit, read the uh, Kushio's Legacy series. However, Kushio's Dart is on my desk at home. Because my, my good friend Kendra said, now that you've read Starless, you you have to read this. They're big door stoppers. I don't expect anybody to just like <laughs> pop through them casually. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was she was she was also telling me that uh, to be prepared for there's because there's quite a bit of heat in them as well. Yes. <laughs> and there was not in this. This was this was very it's, it's very friendly PG. to, to yeah. all readers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, aside from all the murder and death and whatnot. Well, well I, oh, I see, I see, but... I love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, Kai, he was a, uh, and you described him perfectly in uh, during your signing as a murdery little bastard, and he really is. Is He is very good at killing. <laughs> and he quite enjoys it. Oh, yes. Well, and I didn't know uh, who my favorite was by the end, if it, if it was him or Zaria or Zariah? Zaria. Zaria, mm -hmm. um, because I loved her so much. She was fantastic. I mean, she was just not the typical princess at all, and, and I loved it. 
Um, now, you did something in this book that frustrated the hell of me, out of me, for 582 pages. You had, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you will know what it is, because I don't want to spoil anything. Okay. There's a tension that builds up throughout this book, until the very last few pages between two of the characters. And by halfway through the book, I was begging for this tension to be relieved. I was like, oh my gosh, this has to happen. I, I need this to happen. And the funny thing to me was, is you never, you never came out and, and said, this person, person feels this tension about this, ever, throughout the whole book. But it was still there. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of us who, who write, how do you go about crafting that into your story? This, this subtle tension that you know is going to drive your readers crazy and hold them right till the end. Well, this book is written in the first person from Kai's point of view. So you do have some insight into what he's feeling. Um, but for me, a lot of it also can be, you rely on subtle nonverbal cues and tone and gesture. And I think, um, you know, there's something actors call like a, a bit of business. Okay. Uh, when you might, you know, pick something up and fiddle with it. Okay. Maybe it's a glance, a touch. So you just kind of keep that rolling in a non-obvious manner. Easier said than done, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I definitely think, and I... And, and once I started thinking about it, I was th thumbing back through this book and noticing that when you're when you're describing characters' emotions, you're never saying Kai felt this, Kai feels like this, anything else. It's it's all and we say show don't tell a lot in the writing right, world, but right. you really do it. And is is that something you always had, or is that something that you really had to? to teach yourself? Um, I'm going to say it's a little bit of both. Um, I've always been pretty good with the metaphor and, and poetic language. Um, I would also say read poetry. Okay. You know, if you want to get it expressing things in a not super direct on the nose way, um, you know, anything from classics to good contemporary poets uh, can teach you a lot about how to use language. And you actually, you studied literature in, back in school, didn't mm -hmm. you? Literature and psychology? Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Two things that have obviously worked very well for you as a, as a writer. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So now, how different was writing Starless for you than, say, way back to the Kushos? trilogies. You know, do you, do you have a different approach now to, to writing? Uh, not really from a creative standpoint, I wouldn't say. Um, one huge difference is I've been a full-time writer for a good maybe 15 years at this point. And when I was writing, uh, for sure, the first Kushiel's Legacy trilogy, I was still working a full-time day oh, job. Okay. So writing was like the most precious time in the world and I had to scrap and fight and claw for every minute. So what was it like when you first started out and when you were still working your day job? I mean, because now you're, you're writing full-time and that's, that's an awesome thing, mm -hmm. but what were those first years like? Was there a lot of struggling to, to get noticed and, and to get the attention of a publisher? or? Did you, did you get lucky right away, or...? No, 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 no. Um, one of the secrets of writing a really polished debut novel is to write at least one practice novel first. Uh, I have three. <laughs> uh, none of which have ever been published, nor ever will. Um, so it was a solid 10 years that I kept writing and pushing myself. And uh, for me, part of what worked for 
professionally was to always be working on something new so that when I got a rejection um, or multiple rejections, I do have the proverbial you know, shoebox, um, I could say, okay, that one, that one wasn't the one, but this one is the one. And eventually it was true. <laughs> All right, so we have a couple questions here for you. The people have written in, hoping to find answers for you. We'll start with the most, uh, the most business-related one. Daniel wants to know if what process you use to choose a publisher. Are you looking at royalties or, or a pay per word or other benefits that come come with it? Or um, I chose to go the agent route. Um, and which I do not regret at all. Um, I've been traditionally published throughout my career, uh, starting, I think the first book sold in 1998. So like self-publishing wasn't even a thing on the horizon. Um, and an agent will take 15% of everything you make, 20% of international sales. What they have is access and can get your work to the desk of editors with the ability to acquire a manuscript. Um, so I've had professional guidance throughout my career. Um, one of the reasons we went with Tor Books, who I'm now back with initially, um, there were a few different publishers interested in Cushiel Start. Tor was willing to make an offer for three books, not just one. And they were also the ones who, the only ones who said, yeah, it's a really big book, but we're committed to publishing this as a single volume. And um, my agent said, you know, I know you kind of wanted to maybe go a little more mainstream with this, but if you go with somebody like a, I don't know, Random House or whoever, if this book doesn't do well, that's going to be it. Tor will commit to building a career for you. That's fantastic. And have you been happy with him? Well, I, I did end up leaving <laughs> at one point, but um, no burn bridges, all goodwill. Um, I have since been with uh, Penguin Random House, uh, with uh, Grand Central. Um, and I'm now back at tour with my original editor. So. All right. All right. Well, that's, that's good. That's good. So for, for those of us, and, and I'm published by a small press, which is like a, like a publisher with no money. So, um, so I, don't, I don't have a big advertising budget, but I, I know a, a lot of authors that are, that are self-publishing, a lot of authors that are published by small presses. Mm -hmm. Would you encourage them to keep fighting for that big five access, you know, those those mainstream publishing houses, or? You know, it, it really depends. Um, I, I don't have experience with being published by a small press or self-publishing. Uh, I do know royalty rates with the big five are pretty terrible. Um, if you are a good promoter, a good marketer, you can probably make more money self-publishing. Um, but again, I can't really speak directly to it. Okay. No, that's fair enough. What you don't get it will be distribution. Getting your books out there in the brick and mortar bookstores. Yeah. And that's been, that's been my challenge. I have three releases coming up this year with a, with a, a new small press publisher and while I'm excited about it, it's a lot of the work still falls on me to go and knock on doors to the, to the small bookstores like Readers World and Holland and say, hey, these are coming out. Yes, it's available on, on Ingram and everything you're used to, but it's me doing it. <laughs> and my royalty rate is going to be good. I, I think my royalty rate is, is going to be in the high 60s. However, there's there's no money behind it either. Right. So right. and that's that's a bummer. So I, I would like to, to climb that ladder further at, at some point. So is there anything that you do you enjoy being an author? I do, yeah. Okay. 
Is this what you've always wanted to do? Uh, not like always as in since I was a, a wee little girl. Mm -hmm. um, I started writing when I was in high school and had transferred from a private school back to public and there was some overlap in the curriculum and I was bored. I started a novel in the back of my notebook. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And it was just this sort of secret habit that I kept up for years and years. Um, it was really terrible. It was like sort of part fantasy, part soap opera. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> nice. And then I graduated from college and didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I took part in a work exchange program with the UK and I had a six month work permit. I got a job in a bookstore. And it was at that point that I looked around and went, people make a living doing this, which in hindsight was pretty naive. <laughs> Some people make a living doing yeah. it. You make a living I, doing I it, do. so you, it I works. Actually do. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I was probably 22 when I seriously embarked on writing a book that had a narrative structure and wasn't just self-indulgent meandering. And then when did the, the deal with Tor come? Uh, probably about 12 years after that. Okay. 11, okay. I mean, 11 so years. So you were in your early 30s? Yeah. So. Okay. Is it... Is there anything about this life that you don't like? Um, I'll tell you, <laughs> it used to be before the economic downturn, uh, a little more glamorous to be on a book tour where you'd fly into a city and a media escort would come pick you up and they'd take you out to lunch on the publisher's dime. They'd drive you where you needed to go and make sure you got there on time. This sounds perfect. It was great. <laughs> and I just got back from uh, last month. Now it's like Mission Impossible, where it's like, all right, you have landed. You have three hours to get to your hotel, check in, and then get yourself to your book signing. Please take an Uber, Lyft, or taxi. Keep your receipts. Good luck. <laughs> By the way, it's time to check in for your next book. Oh, oh goodness. <laughs> so... Which, I mean, I, I don't mean to sound ungrateful because that's still awesome to have those yeah, opportunities. Yeah. But I, I was feeling kind of like, you know, next year I'm going full on Danny Glover and Lethal Weapon. I'm too old for this shit. But, but and you know, and that's, have you, have you been directly affected by this, this downturn over the last few years quite a bit? I mean, does it affect book sales, or is it more in the way uh, the publishers are, are treating you? It, it's a little of both. Um, I signed probably the biggest deal of my life before 2008, and that's one of the very few uh, that didn't earn out. And it's in part because sales dropped off. And when that happens, there's sort of a domino effect where... You're not going to get an offer for that big of a deal again okay. unless you have something that breaks through in a okay. huge way. So it it's not always it's not always easy when, even once you reach that upper echelon of, of uh, publishers. Yeah. Recently on your your blog, when you were posting about Starless, you had a little bit of. You had a, a letter to family and friends. Mm. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, I do. Yeah. Are you okay with talking about that? Yeah, I am. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about about what that letter was and, and how it came, why you wrote it? Um, this was me saying to family and friends that, honestly, you guys, I love you, I adore you. I don't really feel supported by you as an author. Uh... And I think it's just a, kind of a cumulative effect of um, realizing that nobody had congratulated me on the release of the book, uh, told me they'd liked anything I've written in the last 10 years. And I, I, I think a lot of family and friends were kind of mortified. Um, 
if you do reach, the books are tough. You know, it's not like, hey, look, here's a painting I did. And you go, oh, well, I can take that in in 30 seconds. Yeah. And working in a genre where people often assume, I'm just not going to like it. I don't read that. Um, sometimes they simply won't. Or if they know, in my case, oh, well, you know, you've got a fan base. You don't need to hear from me. And I just kind of hit a point where I'm like, yeah, actually, I do. I think I said in the post, um, at some point, your silence becomes kind of deafening. Yeah. Well, and it, it just wasn't what I was expecting to, to hear. It, and, and it especially hit home because my, my co-host, Katie, I had asked her if there's anything that, that she'd like me to ask you. And her question was that, you know, I know when you're on top of your game, everybody pays lots of attention to you, but what do you do when you're not on top of game and your game and no one's paying attention to you? And I was like, well, you know, it, it kind of sounds like it's going the opposite way, though. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's that, it's not something I expected to hear at all. Yeah, I, I, I'm not generally good at expressing vulnerability, but I'm trying to become a little better at it. Uh, the world's a really ugly place right about now. I think we all need to be a little more careful and tender with each other. I think so too. I realize, you know, I can't expect family and friends to know, hey, your silence is hurtful. I don't say anything about it. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. So, check on your friends, love your family. Well, I think that's a good place to, to end our discussion for I today. Think so too. That's all right. Yeah. So, Thank you so much for for coming on the show today. Thank you for talking a little bit about Starless with us. And hopefully we'll we'll have some listeners that come out and pick it up. uh, My pleasure. Thanks for for having me. It's been good. It's been good. All right, everybody. Thank you for staying tuned for another episode of... Well, not staying tuned. That was terrible. (laughs) Oh, my Lord. I got it. Thank you for watching another episode of Spilling Ink, the talk show that takes you behind the book to meet the authors and artists in the publishing world. Thank you, Jacqueline, for coming on today. It's been great to have you. Thank you. It's been great to be here, and I'm sorry about all the background noise. Oh, yes, we have someone <laughs> chainsawing in the background. So for those of you who are it wondering what that noise chipper. is... I'm not sure. <laughs> there might be a Fargo situation he, going he on. Said, Oh, my gosh. I'm going to have to drive by and see if there's like a briefcase full of cash now. <laughs> All right, have a good night, everybody.